say that I flew over to the White House in an airplane that had 18,000 gallons worth of gas. They said that I displayed terroristic activity and a terroristic mindset when I did this. I pulled the throttle back and the throttle just like shook in my hand. Just go, figure it out, fly your plane. So that's what I did. Born in Virginia, uh, Culpeper, Virginia, um, to, so my mom was like, I think 24 when I was born and my dad was, uh, in his fifties, I believe. Um, wow. <clears throat> yeah. So there's a hell of an age difference between the two of them. Um, right. they're, uh, they had a bunch of issues. Um, my dad left, um, there was, you know, wasn't. On the outside, you know, the house looked great, the the picture looked great, but the people inside the house, you know, they weren't great, right. to be honest with you. Um, each individually great people, um, you know, in their own way, but uh, young cup, my mom being super young and kind of still being, you know, I mean, I say I always say college age, you know, when having me and then jumping right into a family, you know, I, they're there was definitely a disconnect. Um, we moved uh, to Albany, Georgia, um, and then like right after 9-11, um, my dad moved to Virginia um, and uh, my mom moved back to Pennsylvania. So um, definitely hard growing up, you know, between two states um, because they would bounce me back and forth. You know, I would go um, it. it every other weekend or sometimes every weekend, you know, Friday night, my mom's spending two hours driving, you know, all the way down to Thurmont, Maryland to my dad to give me, you know, off for the weekend. So I go hang out there and it was just, it was super weird. Um, I was diagnosed with autism pretty early and I don't know how much that kind of like affected my mom. Um, because like, as soon as that happened, a switch flipped inside of her and uh, so the school told her hey for him to be in school he has to be on medication and I, you know i i guess my mom and and being so young didn't really you know kind of know what the implications of that would be you know what the implications of putting your kids on on psych meds would be and to be honest with you i mean it's been the reason why i've had you know and we'll, we'll get into it and talk about it just the immense problems that i've had in my life um right you, you know uh so the substance abuse issues definitely i mean when you give a child uh, a medication and you tell a child hey you have a problem but guess what i'm gonna give you this it's gonna fix it they get that ingrained in their head and i did and so every single time i would get you know the medication i would think i was fixed <laughs> but they weren't fixing anything they're just masking problems right so um you know bouncing back and forth between the two um you know it was definitely really hard and i didn't kind of know my dad you know um it was real hard for us to connect i think theo vaughn has a uh um a, a bit about old parents and he says yeah, you know yeah. we used to play games like catch or don't and i mean that's <laughs> It's really true. I mean, we used to, uh, it, he, it was very hard for him to connect to me as a child. Um, he was obsessed with airplanes and real estate. Those are the, in Bud Light. It's like, those are the only three things he cared about. Right. And, you know, he gave, he got me the flying bug early, which to his credit is probably the best thing he did. Um, you know, got me the flying bug um, got me involved in everything that he could aviation. He had some buddies that, uh, owned some airplanes. He got in a partnership with one of them. Um, they bought four or five airplanes, sold them off, traded them back and forth. Didn't really kind of work. I think in his mind, he was thinking, Oh, well, I'll get Ryan trained up, you know, and then he'll be able to fly us around and we'll be able to make all these real estate deals. I think he, he was a real pie in the sky kind of a guy. Right. Um, and so, um, I was having trouble, you know, as an adolescent, I, I, they kept changing my medications. Um, you know, you know, and I, I, I know I skip around a lot. I'm going to, you know, tie everything all up in a bow. No, it's um, all right. I, I get, it. I think that ties in perfect with your, who your dad was explaining that. 
Sure. So, yeah. So, um, um, you, you know, I, uh, I decided to leave my mom's. I was tired of being put on. Um, so what I age? must've been about 14, 13 or 14 the first time. Okay. So this happened right. a couple different times. And, you know, my mom was out dating. She had a, a boyfriend that, that, I mean, it worked out for so great, but it was chaotic, you know, for me as a kid. And I hadn't realized all the infidelity that my dad had been involved with. You know, my dad was just the cool guy. You know, he right. was the one that that he, rules at his house were super lax. Um, He'd let me drink beer. You know, I mean, we could I could do anything. I want, And you're in the country. So at my mom's house, you know, my neighbor is literally. 55 feet maybe 60 feet away from me right and at my dad's my nearest neighbor's a mile away and you better hope that they're home <laughs> because if not nobody's getting to you um right and, and so i noticed that there was a freedom out there that there was a fun out there that there wasn't at my mom's and when i was down at my dad's i didn't have to take my meds because my dad didn't believe in any, in any of that crap. You know, um, they both kind of abandoned the autism diagnosis pretty early. Um, you my mom strike me as autistic. <laughs> Sorry. You, you know? Huh? Oh, I don't. You said I don't. I said you, you don't strike me as autistic. Oh, it's bad. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, no. The So for, for me, the autism comes in in the thinking patterns. Um, I. So I have a run and loop that's, you know, always going on and it's all engineering stuff. I'm always trying to solve some type of problem while I'm doing something else. Right. Um, also, the way I look at things, um, I'm not very empathetic. Um, I, I really have trouble connecting with human emotion with some things. And I hate saying that because it kind of makes me sound psychotic. But I, I just... I can understand the outcome of those human emotions. You know, like if I see right. somebody crying, I can understand, you know, oh, they're crying. They must be upset. But it's always for me, though, well, explain the situation. All right. That really sucks and it's bad. But there's always something that could be like I. it's super hard for me to connect. You know, yeah. um, so th and that's how it comes out. Uh, uh, for me also um, I, I have kind of no filter I, I, I just kind of say the first thing that comes to mind and it's sometimes insensitive um, right. I don't I, that's a, a thing that I and, and conflict resolution is not the greatest for me so I understand why conflict happens but I don't connect with it you know right um, so and then and, and kind of explaining my situation and kind of what happened to me, I, I think that will come out. Um, you know, I, I definitely, you, you know, people sit back and say, oh, well, you know, you need to take more responsibility for your actions and things. And I take responsibility for everything. You know, I did what I did. hundred percent. It was me. I was the guy. But I have trouble in some issues, you know, like with saying that I did the wrong thing. Like the incident, sh and, and again, like we'll, we'll talk about that. The incident shouldn't have happened, but rules and regulations wise and then training wise, I followed exactly what I should have done right. given that situation. Just where, where I had to disconnect is, is I should have never put myself in that situation to happen. Right. So, okay. So anyway, so, so. Your, your dad, you, so you went back and forth around 14. You're, you're not taking your medication. Yeah. So I'm not taking my medication, you know, and I think the act of like coming off of those medications, I, I really think that, that, that it does something. I think that like, there's a withdrawal period and I just, I, I, to say psychotic, to say that I was in a, a um, the throes of psychosis. I mean, that's probably true. Um, I would fight with kind of everybody, um, you know, for the first two or three days I would come home the, you know, if my mom would keep me, if it would be one of those times where it'd be like two weeks. All right. I would get stabilized again, but I would be a zombie. 
you know, I would right. be on, uh, you know, I wouldn't be able, it would be hard for me to, to stay awake in school just because of how much medication I was on. Um, I had gotten a girlfriend, uh, pretty, pretty early, um, in high school. Um, and this was, so I was in high school in, in Pennsylvania where my mom was and, uh, kind of, you know, being a new kid in school, you know, you're only there for about a year or two, you know, everybody in that school grew up together. Um, and, uh, I had a girlfriend was dating her for about eight months and my grades started to slip. Mom seen them. And that this is when I say everything like took a turn for kind of the worst. So um, my mom seen my grades were slipping, seen my attitude was changing. Um, loved the girl I was dating because she was the best, you know, but didn't want me to have a girlfriend. So made me break up with her. In the process of that, I didn't realize how much other stuff Danielle was going through in her life, and she ended up killing herself like a week and a half later. Whoa. Well, in a school where everybody, you know, is so tight-knit, you grew up together, you were raised together. Um, I mean, they literally destroyed me. You know, everybody thought that it was my fault. Nobody knew the actual story back behind it. So they ostracized the heck out of me. And when I say they ostracized the heck out of me, I mean, it was, I had a car, um, I had a 98 Jeep Cherokee that they broke every window on, slashed every tire. You know, that truck sat for like a week until I could get it. You know, um, it, I had a, uh, I mean, I was beaten up constantly. And, and so Pennsylvania, you can't sell beers in the stores. My family owns the only beer distributor in town. So Everybody knows me. Everybody knows where to find me. Everybody knows who my mom was. You know, and I mean, some of these kids, their parents went to school with my mom. Right. You know, so at that point, the family kind of, you know, even turned their back on me. And so I didn't know where to go. So I was like, I'm off to dad's. Bye. What do you mean your family turned? Your, your mother's the one that said break up with her. Yeah, well, my mom didn't. My mom never told that side of the story. Okay. And to this day, she still, to this day, she still doesn't want to say that that's, you know, th the whole reality. We've argued about it. And, you know, I keep trying to tell her I ended up um, t about five or six months later, I was going through my emails. There was an email that I had never seen. I didn't know the email address. It, you know, it was kind of innocuous. And it was her, you know, farewell letter, basically, you know, explaining, hey, this wasn't your fault. You know, I was going through a lot with my sisters. You know, I, she was in the shadow of, of, of being, uh, of, of, you know, two sisters that, you, you know, it, there was a lot of competition in that family, I assume. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that there was a lot of pressure from her family, too, to succeed, to, you, you know, to, to be the kind of shining star. And then, you know. I'm sure in some way that that I was the the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, it's still something, you know, that I deal with today, obviously. Um, but, yeah, so I ran away. You know, my mom, my mom never told that side of the story. And my mom never, I mean, she said, oh, yeah, well, you know, I didn't want him to have a girlfriend. Oh, yeah, you know, his grades were slipping. She She shadowed everything else around. Well, I guess her and my dad had kind of been talking, you know, without me around. And my dad threw a pie in the sky offer, you know, out and said, hey, you know, we'll, we're going to go. We're going to send him to, the, you know, the best place. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to make sure that he has all the, the, the help that he can get, you, you know. Um, Central Virginia or Northern Virginia has got great mental health and, and, you know, he can go see the guy that I talked to and all this stuff. Well, that's not a great decision. You're, you should not ever go and see the same therapist that your, that your dad does. Um, and so my mom kind of was reluctant, but she was like, well, you know, I'll give him a shot. You know, yeah, the schools are kind of better. You know, he's not going to be bullied. Um, you know, there was more, so I had an IEP in school, so there was more support for that, for those type of kids that had, you know, integrated education plans. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And so I went down there and within a week, it was like a disaster. You know, I mean, my dad, everything he told her was kind of like it, it. When they traded me, it was so funny. When they traded me off, dad was like, you know, he said, oh, she thinks that I'm going to go and do all this. Yeah, no, you're you're going to grow up like a normal kid. And I right. Was, okay all right whatever that means um but it got me a chance to be around the aviation community it got me a chance to be around you know airplanes and it got me a chance to be interested in something that you know i mean obviously shaped you know the course of my life and continues to shape the course of my life um i uh I continued flight training all the way up until about 2008. Um, I was ready to solo. I was ready to do all my sign-offs and certificates and stuff. And then um, I had had that diagnosis of bipolar, you know, all the diagnosis. And so um, I went to go get my medical and I got denied because of the medication that I was on. And I was like devastated because I was, you know, didn't know what to do. You know, I didn't really like anything else because I hadn't really gotten into anything else. You know, I played guitar on the side. Um, you know, it's kind of like a hobby. Um, we had horses at that farm. Um, Dad had built uh, a, a, another uh, end of the barn, some places to put some machineries and some places to build an airplane and, and some other things. They actually had a uh, um, an unpaved, unfinished surface in the back where you could land. Um and uh who <clears throat> y- y- you know i didn't uh i wasn't able to finish school um y- y- when they told me that i couldn't get that medical you know i kind of like lost my grip um y- y- you know at least on my mental health definitely for sure um cuz i didn't know really where to y- y- i didn't know where to go you know and i i absolutely had no idea um, what to do. Um, and I had gotten so like obsessed and ultra focused with flying, you know, like I said, I didn't seek anything else out. So I didn't see a way and a path for anything else. You know, dad had kind of, you know, pushed it. This is, you know, the uh, uh, grooming's a, a, not a great term, obviously because of the connotation that it has nowadays, but that's what he was like literally grooming me for. Um, and so I figured, well, oh, I'll try a job in, you, you know, aviation. So I got a job at Dulles Airport. Um, I was like 17 years old. Um, couldn't be on their insurance because I wasn't 18. And so I got, you know, it was the first time I ever got fired from an aviation job. First time I actually I ever had a job that I technically got fired from. Um, and so I kind of got like a disdain for, for employment. Well, Why did you get fired? Because they can't for, at Dulles International Airport. If you're under 18, you can't be on the airport's insurance. Well, it's not really fired. That's they're letting you go. You get getting let, fired. Like, hey, you fucked up. It's like no, hey, no, no. So it wasn't we, well. We let you go because yeah, but so but they still write it. They still because they're a bigger company. They still wrote like a termination letter and everything. And so that's right. how I kind of looked at it. As I looked at it, like I got fired. I looked at it like I lost a job, and it was kind of like i didn't feel good enough because i was like well you know once i turn 18 all this will change and so i couldn't make it you know i just i i did i didn't make it um i ended up so my dad had uh married a woman like as soon as the ink dried on his divorce to to decree from my mom um so that was a point of contention um that broke bad, you know, almost immediately, uh, as soon as they got married and I, um, I, I could not stand her, you know, I mean, I don't ever like to, to down talk women, but I mean, she was 53 years old, had never been married and spent 33 years at secret service. Okay. And she was one of those, and it's a finite group of people that this happens to, but they get ultra focused on government work. And then that becomes their entire life and their entire focus. Um, so she, uh, she was a monster. Um, 
she actually had me arrested the first time. It was the first time I was ever in, in jail, she had me arrested. So her and my dad got in a, in a fight. Um, they had gotten drunk. I mean, a fist what? fight or an argument. When I got there, it was, I mean, he had her on the ground and he was choking her. And Sounds so, like well, and I did the only thing I know to do, because if you call anybody they're an hour out, at least. Help and, dispose of the body. Oh, I, oh man, I, 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 oh yeah, I, I jumped in the middle of them. Well, jumping in the middle of them, I didn't realize that that makes me an aggressor in the, in the eyes of the sheriff's department. So she had ended, I got him off of her. She immediately ran to the phone and called the cops. And her lie was, oh, my stepson attacked me. Okay. Oh yeah. My stepson attacked me. And I said, oh, so the, the sheriff's department comes, you know, they show up, everybody starts getting interviewed. Well, I'm the only one that doesn't have any, you know, marks on me, any physical, you know, I'm the only one. Okay. So, but I attacked you. So how did he get the marks on him? Well, they didn't want to hear any of that. They didn't, they had, they, they cared nothing about that. All they cared about was, is that I had mental health disturbances and, um, I had been to the hospital for those mental health disturbances, and I must have attacked. Right. Not to mention, my dad can't form a sentence, you know. So, but both of them, by the way, in, in the eyes of the law to me, both of them are given, you know, a testimony while they're hammered. So that should not be admissible at all. Right. But yet, yet, lo and behold, I get taken away in cuffs. What are you, 17 now or 18? 17. Okay. Yeah, seventeen. Uh, so they take me to the adult to the uh, juvenile detention center. I'm there for like three or four days. Uh, I mean that's miserable because their juvenile detention center was basically you know just a concrete box, you know concrete slab. You got a little thin mattress, a little alligator you're on. Um, right. And uh, whew. um, you know I couldn't talk to anybody. I couldn't talk to any of my parents. I had gotten so um. That was my first time in jail, but it was my first time getting a charge because I got a DUI the year before then. Um, just driving to a friend's house. Uh, we had, I, you know, got some of dad's liquor. We were going to play some video games. Um, we drank. I go to leave. It was like two o'clock at night, and I down. I had a six speed car, and I downshifted. And when I downshifted, I kind of swerved, and there was a cop that was just kind of like watching me the entire time. He knew exactly what it was, you know, came up and said, hey, I seen you swerving. You're probably drunk. Pull me out. So I was on probation for that. Well, luckily, my probation officer was kind of a cool chick and she knew this the problem because I would talk to her. You know, I would connect with her. I would say, hey, you know, there's things in this house that are going on that I don't like. You know, those two do not get along. And I mean, yeah, I was snitching on my dad, but hell, I, I mean, something had to give because it was going to come to a head. Um, and then, and she said, well, we're going to get you out of here and it's probably better off if you go back to your mom's, you know, figure out a way that we can get it. So they talked, they got in together. Um, she put in a, a paper for me to be taken off of probation. So um, they took me off of probation, but then they suspended my driver's license. So they're like, well, you know, we gave him the probation. We didn't suspend his license because he technically didn't have a license. But now we're going to suspend it and we'll take him off of probation. He can go to Pennsylvania. So I go up to Pennsylvania and um, I guess my mom kind of, you know, thought that I had been, you know, drinking with friends and things like that. So she went and put me into treatment the first time. So I'm around, and this was right at the height of when Philadelphia had their heroin epidemic, when heroin had just hit. And, uh, I mean, it had spilled out all the way out into, you know, the little communities, and that's where you can put rehabs. So I, that's what I was around. I was just, you know, a kid that really liked to drink and liked to smoke pot and cigarettes and all that stuff, you know, going at 17 years old, going into rehab for, you know, alcoholism right with heroin addicts with all heroin addicts i mean i was the only one that was in there for alcohol and their whole their whole so 
that's the first time um, I was ever put on Suboxone, um, which is a, I mean, that stuff is kind of, is almost worse than heroin in some respects. I mean, it's definitely worse to come off of, for sure. So, um, yeah, I, I, I leave that rehab, um, and it, again, that rehab didn't take at all. Um, I, uh, like almost, almost within four or five months from leaving rehab, you know, I was hanging out with friends, doing pills, um, taking Xanaxes like they were going out of style. Um, I had a, actually gotten a prescription for them while I was in the rehab. And, uh, so I had some friends that broke into a house beside, that was beside my mom's house and they stole all kinds of electronics and stuff out of it. Um, and then in a, I had must've taken probably seven or eight of those things and walked into my neighbor's house and took his Xbox from his TV. Had no reason why. None. I don't. Couldn't I understand. Maybe. I don't. So you had taken some of the electronics from the neighbors. No, no, no. So I took some Xanax and uh, I ate about six or seven of them, and then I just walked into my neighbor's house. I'm like 18, almost 19. Walked into my neighbor's house and took his Xbox. I had no reason why. I mean, this same this neighbor kid. that had been burglarized. No, it was the other neighbor. It was the neighbor that that. So that the neighbor that had been burglarized, he didn't have any kids. Okay. Um, but the the kids that i was hanging out with they seen that he had all kinds of flashy stuff and i think in the middle of the night they had gone into his house and and stolen a bunch of things um so anyway so i take this kid's xbox well they call the cops um obviously um this is how zonked out i was so it had snowed and they the the way that they knew it was me is because they followed the footprints in the snow back to my house from his porch back Some to my good, porch. good police work. Oh yeah. Oh, t- t- shout out to, to uh, borough cops. <laughs> so, um, they arrested me and put me in jail. No bond. Right. So I go to big boy jail this time. Uh, real big boy jail. Um, Lancaster County prison. So they don't have any central air at all. Um, there's no heat, no air conditioning. Um, they call it the castle. It's, it is a, well, I'm assuming it was a castle, but it's dead center in the middle of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And it is a disgusting place. So this is a jail, not a prison. Yeah. Well, so it's a county prison, so you can stay up there, you know, up to a year. You can do up, you can do one day less a year. Okay. So had you been sentenced or they're just holding you there? No, they're just holding me. No bond. Okay. Um, they go. They 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 hold me no bond. Um, they say that I had uh, ties to Virginia and that I could flee. Um, you know, uh, my my mom would not sign for me. Um, you know, naturally that was her kind of like. She says, "Oh well, you, you know, I didn't want to sign for you because you were a danger to yourself, and you know, we didn't want you around." Da da da. da. Okay. Well, cool. Um. So that was, you know, kind of her rationale for it. Well, right. so I, I got pushed back sentencing. So I was in 11 months before I got, no, nine months before I got sentenced. Um, never run. They, and, and, you know, you would think, oh, well, well, you waited nine months to get sentenced. Well, what did they do? Run a PSI on you? Did they, you know, do all kinds of an investigation? They did nothing. They did nothing. I just refused to sign the plea agreement. Right. Because their first plea agreement they came to me was, oh, well, you're going to take uh, unlawful entry of a structure. Um, you know, it's it's a five-year, you know, maximum. And, uh, you know, uh, we're not going to we're not going to allow you to take it to trial. And I was like, well, I got a right to take this to trial. And then my lawyer stepped up and was like, dude, you don't want to take it to trial. You take it to trial, they're going to give you the statutory maximum that they can. Okay. Well, so then they come to me and they say, okay, well, you know, we're, we're going to give you a, well, Pennsylvania doesn't have a breaking and entering statute. So Pennsylvania statute is anything. If I enter your house and I'm not authorized to be there, it's not an unlawful entry. It is a breaking and entering, but I don't have to physically break anything. 
Right. You know, I just have to cross the threshold of that structure where I am not welcome. Right. And so in the midst, they were having, because of this heroin epidemic, they were having a terrible problem with break-ins. I mean, they were having, it was, and the judge I got threw the absolute book at me. So um, he sentenced me to a one to two years in prison uh, with, um, I could be eligible for parole after nine and a half months. Well, okay, so I had been in, you know, almost 10 by the time I got to prison. Doesn't, right. you know, doesn't that time count? And right as soon as I got to Camp Hill, they had told the parole board had come to me and said, well, um, we're not going to we're, we're not offering you pro, uh, parole. Um, you, you know, you, you haven't been in our system long enough. We don't know you. Um, and so he said, I'm not even going to put him. So I had a counselor and, and Garner said, I'm not I'm not going to put you in for it. And I said, uh, OK, cool. So then I came back and I got, you know, like a real case of the ass with him. And I said, you know what? Well, you guys can take the parole and shove it. I said, max me out. Max me out. I said, by the way, I don't want to be on probation and parole because if I'm on county probation for a year after this, you know, and state parole, I said, that mean, and I'm going to go out of state because I'm not staying in Pennsylvania. I didn't want, I didn't, you know, I had disdain for the state at that point. So I was like, I don't want to stay here. You know, I'm going to go to Virginia. Dad's obviously going to take me in. And, um, he, you know, I, that was my, you know, my bright idea, max out. Well, when you say max out, then you take away your ability to ever go for parole again. So, okay, yeah. So, but, you know, I did my two years, I got released, I went to Virginia and within, you, you know, literally the same thing happened there. I was with a buddy, um, and, uh, he comes to me, says, Hey, you know, and I had been at this point. So while I was in prison in uh, Pennsylvania, I met heroin for the first time. Uh, first time I ever did drugs, you know, okay. and I, I, I make the joke, I, you, you know, I have dyslexia. So everything I do is, you know, backwards. Normally people go into jail for drugs. I went into jail kind of for drugs, but I met drugs in there. You know, people right. do drugs and go to jail. I went to jail to do drugs. Um, and uh, I left with kind of like a habit, um, you know, definitely a pill habit. And uh, I met a guy that, you know, was selling pills in Virginia. And, you know, I got all pilled out one night. And he said, hey, you know, take me out to the store. And he go go out to the store and he ended up breaking into it. I didn't even realize the store wasn't open. You know, they had all their lights on and everything, you know, he right. was literally he goes around to what it looked like, you know, the side of the building, which, you know, where another door would be. And, you know, the next thing I know, I hear an alarm. He comes running out with a hand with, you know, cartons of cigarettes, hops in a truck. I drop him off. And, you know, three hours later, they're coming up to my house. You know, a felony warrant. Repeat offender. How is you know, that? How did they figure that out? No, uh, the license. They, they, they see. Well, I'm. Uh, they seen the truck, and the truck was a farm truck. So, right. I think the cop. I think the sh the captain for the sheriff's department lived at the top of that ro my road. Right. So he passed that. He passed my house every day. See the truck, and so I'm assuming he just went to where the truck was. They come. They bust in the house. They didn't have a warrant. They didn't know actually who I was. They just busted in the house. Went and searched for, I guess, whatever was missing. There was nothing missing in the house. Cause I didn't take anything. I didn't have nothing. Right. But you know, I get arrested for it. So I get arrested for it, go to court. Um, I refuse to testify. You know, I refuse to tell them who I was with I'll, one, because I didn't know who the, you know, dude's real name. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I take the, the, the fall for that. Um, and then they give me, so they give me 10 years for the, for the breaking and entering. 10 years they, probation or 10 years in court, in, in prison? 10 years in the Department of Corrections. Why did you take it to trial? They got nothing, but I, I drove a truck. Yeah, I got in my fucking truck. Taking it to trial, tr taking it to trial, I got in 20. 
they'd have had to give me the maximum because they wouldn't they they wouldn't pay for a jury trial. See, this is the thing about Virginia that people don't understand. So they won't pay for a jury trial in those little counties. They won't even hold a jury trial in most of those little counties. What they'll do is they'll change a venue. They'll put in a, a motion to change venue, and they'll send you to whatever the biggest court is around. And usually you want that because the circuit court judge that's going to try the case is the circuit court judge for, you know, five other counties, you know, the adjoining five counties, you know, um, so usually you want that change, that change of venue. The other thing people don't realize is, is, is that it's all backwards. You take a plea. So Virginia suspends time. So they give me 10 years, but then they suspend seven years and nine months of it. Okay. So they put you on a good behavior statute. Well, since Virginia doesn't have a probation statute, when you violate your probation, it is a brand spanking new felony. So when you look at my background and you, and you go back and you say, oh, well, he's got 10 felonies. He's got 10 breaking and enterings. No, I don't. I have one break. I have two breaking and enterings. And I have subsequently five pr felony probation violations. Okay. Well, they get graded the same on a background check. They get graded the same against you for security clearance. They get, it's, it's all graded the same. So, so I'm thinking at no point in this are you going to get a pilot's license. Well, You're well past the pilot's license stage. Actually, no, because none of those, I mean, because none of those charges. So at this point, none of those charges were related to aviation. Okay. None of them were violent. And at that point, none of them had to do with anything with substances, no drugs, nothing. You know, I didn't get my, I didn't get my, my first drug charge until 2016. Okay. Um, but Virginia has no programs. They have their, their department of corrections is filthy and they have no pre approach protocol. They do now, but, um, you know, I was victimized there. Um, you, you know, it was easier to get drugs than it was on the street in there. Right. Um, you know, heroin. Uh, first time I did cocaine was at Powhatan um, at State Farm, Virginia. Um, you know, the first time I tried uh, meth was at uh, Haynesville, Virginia. You know. Um, and these are and, the prisons they're moving you to? Yeah, so uh, there's a um, receiving center, uh, which is your your that's where you land first, right? Um, and uh, everybody goes there. Um, usually, um, it's a, a Powhatan uh, Correctional. Um, now I think they've changed the name of it to State Farm. Um, but there's a couple of prisons on that compound. I think it's like a four thousand acre farm or whatever. Um, but the receiving the receiving center for males and females is there, and then they'll ship you out to what's like your your destination or your home jail, and then that's you know um, whatever one's close enough to your district, or if they want to ship you you know as far away as they can, they'll send you to the level fives out in the mountains um, towards West Virginia. Um, so I went you know to a prison that was kind of close to the location where I was living. Um, it was a uh, Tappahannock, Virginia, um, but Tappahannock's so close to Richmond and all of their guards that they bring in are, you know, inner city Richmond kids, section eight kids. And, you know, the drug trade, the gang trade. I mean, it was it was wild. So I left, you know, that correctional center with a habit. Um, I got shipped off uh, because I was on probation in Pennsylvania. So I get shipped back up to Pennsylvania. Get taken up to Pennsylvania, um, do like three months and back in LCP on, on a probation violation. They take me all the way off probation and then just kick me out the door. Well, the problem is when you get released in those type of situations and you get released from a county center, I'm sure you know. Um, well, they don't give you anything. There's no there's no bus ticket. You know, there's no twenty five dollars. You know, there's no debit card. If, if you had money on your books, that's what you're walking out with. And you better hope that they get you out early so you can cash that check. And you better hope you have an ID that they can cash that check with. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I got released on the streets, got put, you know, back on the streets. Um, I get a heroin charge in 2016 back in Virginia. 
Um, you know, I left Pennsylvania and came back to Virginia, um, bounced back and forth between the two, uh, you know, really learned how to become a criminal, um, the last, that, that last prison stint. Yeah. I was going to say, you need, you need some educating because so far you're, you're horrific at this. Oh yeah. Uh, dude, I was bad. And that was the thing is I wasn't. I wasn't trying to be good at it. You know, I was right. literally trying to be a good person. I just, my whole thing is were, were, were the substances, you know, is, is right. getting off of, uh, and getting around people that didn't. So I can be easily manipulated. Right. You know, I can be easily taken advantage of. It's happened, you know, very many times. Um, I don't normally see it until it's, you know, already happening or, you know, sometimes too late. Right. Well, so I um I leave I get this I get the heroin charge. Uh th that was a uh, I got I got set up and I I was a driver. Um I had uh, an empty lottery ticket on it. They got me for the residue, gave me the 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 charge for the residue. Um full possession charge, full simple possession of heroin. Um but that violated that Virginia probation. Um, so that sent me back to prison for three years. Oh uh, shit. Oh yeah. Three years. Yeah. And then they don't, they didn't send me because I went to a violator's place. Um, they sent me to gangland. So okay. I went to, um, it's the biggest prison on, and I don't know if it still is, but they boasted it was the biggest prison uh, in Virginia, which is definitely true, hundred percent true. I mean, the town is built around the prison. Yeah, um, yeah. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of these towns are. You know what I'm saying? People don't realize that a lot of a lot of times the prison will end up doubling the size of the town mm. because they take the like the Coleman oh, eight thousand of the something like the eighteen thousand in uh um civilians in that town or the you know citizens that make up that town 8000 of them are in the prison. Oh so yeah, there's only, yeah. Like, only 9 or 10,000 people that are, you know, in the town. Oh yeah, that and that's the same way with with uh Greensville Correctional. So Greensville said that they were the biggest uh prison compound on the East Coast. Now again, I don't know if that was true. Um it certainly you could certainly infer that. I mean, they had four prisons on one compound. Yeah. Um That'll and then, it. well, so when I got there, I immediately got in a altercation um, with a gang member and uh, got in an altercation with a cop. So got in a fight um, with a gang member. Cop runs in, tries to break, break up the fight. He ends up kneeing me in um, the kidney to get me down. And so me and him started going at it. Well, they don't play that. And I got, I got put right in a box. Right. And I did my entire three years in that box. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's so worse and worse for you. You're getting yeah. worse and worse at this. <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I, I said when I was in solitary, I never want to ever go through that situation ever again. Like, yeah. I don't ever want. So, you know, I started, um, I re so there was a trustee guy that's sweeping the block and whatever. Um, but he worked in a law library and the law library was the access that you could get into the regular law, law, law library or the regular library. Now you couldn't bring any regular books back with you. You could bring law stuff back, but you could read, you know, regular books while you were there. So I would go. Um, you know, and they would bring their big two rolling carts with all their books on them, you know, and I would find, you know, I'd grab a law book out, I would open it up, but then I'd get another book, you know, something interesting, you know, something maybe about black holes or, you know, UFOs or, you know, ancient Egypt or whatever, whatever, whatever that they had, because there was like no novels or nothing. It was all like history and educational know, stuff. Yeah. Modern technology and things like that. Right. Um, and so, you know, I would just kind of spin myself up on that well i i leave there and you know get done with that and i'm not on any probation at that point at least i didn't think i was well 
they had they had put me on unsupervised probation, but I didn't well, didn't have anybody to check into. You know, I didn't. It was you know, if you get in trouble again, we're gonna you know give you all your backup time. Basically, they they take me, put me back in Fredericksburg, and I just get thrown into that system. Um. I had met a, a a guy that had a bunch of airplanes. Um, he also owned a used car dealership, and I started working for him as a as a mechanic. Um, I started working for him as a as a car mechanic, and then I met his airplane mechanic, and I started working for her for for a while and started learning how to work on airplanes. But being around airplanes so young, you know, um, she said, "Hey, you, you know, you really have a knack for this. You know what you're doing." You know, you've been around these things for, for so long. You've spun yourself up so much on this. You know, you should go for and, and you know, get your AMP. So that's airframe and power plant um, certificate. Um, and that's what, you know, airplane mechanics have to get to be able to work on them. Um, so she's like, you know, I'll do an apprenticeship with you, blah, 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 blah. We'll get you all your certificates. And so that kind of started, you know, me getting into, you know, being around working on airplanes and building airplanes and stuff. Um, I've always had a knack for building. I've always had a knack for like engineering and, you know, kind of figuring out how things work. Right. But that really gave me access to um, Steve Brown. Um, and that's uh, the buddy that I got the airplane that I committed my offense with. Right. Um, and, you know, Steve is basically he's one of these guys that he doesn't want hands on anything uh he wants to be hands off with everything you take it you manage it you do it i'll just i'll pay the bill and you know um he was like hey we'll 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 get this ultralight we'll um uh we'll refabricate we'll 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 do a whole bunch of things to it you know we'll get it all all taken care of um you know and i'll i'll fly it for my business you, you know we'll get new sales for it. we'll paint it up like airport auto sales and you know i'll use it for my business well in the midst of this you know i'm still having all of these drug problems you know i'm fresh out of prison um there's like no resources because they don't do re-entry they don't do um you know they don't do and and, and it's easier to get drugs in prison and it is jail you know so what to that time i left i was you know i might have been 110 pounds leaving you know face sunken in you know you, you're supposed to be big strong jacked when you're leaving you, you know prison now not me um and i uh i was working two jobs you know i i, I was spinning myself i was in five different directions you know just kind of like my brain i wasn't focused on any one given thing well in july of 2018 um i had been out for maybe five and a half months you know steve comes to me and he's like hey i want to buy an ultralight you know i want to want to have uh, an advertisement piece for my, for my um my company uh, okay, cool. Yeah, well, we can do that. We'll find one. So we found this ultralight up in um, Pennsylvania. Um, we go, we look at it. We fly up there. We look at it. I say, yeah, go for it. Guy only wants, I think he wanted like 900 bucks for it or whatever. Okay. You know, nothing's together. There's no manual for it. You know, all the parts are here, but nothing's, you know, built. I'll build it for you. So we put, pack it up in the U-Haul, bring it back. I assemble it, put it together. It takes me like a month. The guy who built the thing, dude had no idea what he was doing. Uh, right. Hey, I guess he, he was an auto mechanic. He built it in the mid eighties and he was, I mean, I mean, he was gone, you know, you know, he had died, I think like 95. So nobody, you know, I basically redesigned this thing, rebuilt it put a bunch of like concept parts on it which is when you read in that article that i showed you where it says oh it was held together with duct tape yeah there's a reason for that you know there was reasons why there was a water bottle overflow uh or a radiator overflow that was a water bottle you know um there were reasons for all these things but it's it it's what the media can use to make fun of me you know right obviously it's 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 what they can they can use to it's that's their attack vector yeah but it's like, okay, 
you know, first of all, they don't make a radiator overflow. That water bottle's cheap. If right. I had to go and buy something, you know, that means that I got to go to him and say, hey, I need to buy this. I don't know if it's going to work. You know, so all those things, all, all the, all of that stuff in there was all proof of concept things. Why did I have duct tape on the wing? Well, I did, well, I'm going to run this thing across the ground. I'm not spending four grand to get new sails right now for it, to get new covering. If the thing's not going to fly, we're just going to abandon the project. Let me right. put some duct tape over it so it doesn't rip a humongous hole in this thing. And we can see if this thing is actually, if these, if it's, you know, going to be structurally safe. So I put, everything together and 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 and, um we take it across the ground a couple of times we put it away we realize engine's not gonna it's just not producing enough power it's just it's not running right sounds bad so we take i take the engine off of it um i find an engine from a sea do from a jet ski okay same engine drive all the way virginia beach go pick it up um put the prop governor on it or the uh the, the reducer on it um get in a fight with my girlfriend that night say hey well i'm leaving so i leave the house i go sleep in a hangar finish building the airplane that 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 night and that's uh september 25th of uh 2018 so i get up the next morning it was you know overcast it was raining there was nobody at the airport nobody was scheduled at any the flight school wasn't even open you know none of the mechanics had showed up I went and bought a gallon of gas, you know, decided to run, you, you know, I already had a gallon in it. I ran a gallon in it that was out, started back up, get onto the, uh, to the taxiway. I, and I get onto the grass runway. And, and so here's, here's my think, my, my thinking and my thought process back behind this. Okay. So it's IMC what instrument, which means instrument meteorological conditions. All right. It's a fancy pilot term just means that um, it's a different rule of flights, a different certification you have to have on your pilot's license to be able to operate in those kind of conditions. So that means that that limits the number of people that are coming in and out of the airport. Now, you can see you can get on um, like a flight aware or any of the flight planning services that are uh, available to file online. And you can look and see if that airport has any scheduled arrivals. So if there's nothing scheduled in and out, usually the flight schools are really good about, especially because of the airspace that they have to operate in, they're really good about filing flight plans. Um, and it's getting more and more common because of how easy it is now. I mean, you can do it with your phone. I could file one right now if I wanted to go and fly. Um, and if I had to now, generally speaking out like where I'm at now, you wouldn't have to do that just because there's not that condensed airspace in Northern Virginia, the airspace is super specific. Uh, there's actually something called the SFRA. It's their pilots call it the SIFRA. And, uh, you have to be certified. Like you have to go online and take a test, um, okay. to be able to even operate in that airspace. And I think that they started that after 2011. Um, when I, I actually took flight training um, when I was taking my flight training was uh, so probably 20 miles from D.C., you know, as the crow would fly. Um, okay. But we're so I was in Loudoun County, it's Leesburg, Virginia, um, and it's Leesburg Executive Airport um, where I first started my training, first started, you know, I did my first, you know, I think 15 hours there, actually, at, at least in, at, there. And then I went to Winchester, which is out, you know, west. But that airspace back in the day, um, and so this is probably 2005, 2006 when, you know, when I first started my training, like you had to actually go walk into a center. You had to talk to a guy, you know, who and he had a, you know, old school computer wasn't even color. It was green. It was that old black and green, the old CRT screen, and it gave you this prompt, and then you'd fill out your flight plan right there, and you'd have to file a one to go out, and then you have to file one to come in. And so you're just a little guy. You're a little, you know, dirt bike with wings up there, you know, but you have to file. You have to do this, and it used to get so bad. If you couldn't get a spot on the radio to come in, they'd make you circle 
you know, until you could hit the button and be able to talk because of all the other traffic, you know, because they're all on the same channel. You know, all the airlines are talking to the same controller that, you know, the little the little guy in the Cessna. Right. You know, that, he, that he has, you know, buzzing around. So, I mean, there'd be times where, you know, we'd actually when we would do our flight training, we'd actually go to another airport. We'd pick up more fuel because we know we're going to be circling, you know, and burning that gas at, you know, eight, eight gallons an hour. So, you know, if we had to circle for 30 minutes, we're, there goes four gallons right there. You know, so it, it like learning to fly up there was super hard. You had to be super on your game. And so when they would hire flight instructors, these were like good guys. They weren't, um, they weren't, you know, idiots. Uh, I, although I, I say that, you know, um, there are a few idiots in there. Well, my flight, oh, few idiots in the bunch. my first, the first guy I ever flew with, he was a great dude. Um, and, and may you rest in peace. Um, him and a student got in a situation and ended up plowing into a, uh, uh, a field back behind the airport. They made a mistake, uh, on landing and ended up getting themselves into a, uh, induced stall condition. Um, and that was really eye opening. I had only taken, you know, two hours of, uh, I, I took my discovery flight with him and, you know, I took my first, uh, my first flight instruction, um, you know, my, my stick and rudder basics with him, and, but that was only one hour. So I, I only had, only had two hours of flight time with him, but, um, you know, from hanging around the airport and talking to the guys, you know, getting into the discovery flight, you know, getting that all scheduled, you, you kind of like you meet these people. And he had been the guy who uh, I had talked to and who they had, you, you know, when we had first reached out for the information, you know, when dad had said, Hey, is this what you want to do? And I said, yeah, duh, absolutely. And, and, um, you know, they said, uh, we, we called, uh, he was the guy. Um, and then right after, you, you know, they assigned me a new flight instructor, you know, Jeff was, uh, he was, uh, aerobatic guy. So, y you know, he knew he could tell you like why things were happening, you know, it was the quality of flight instruction that that dude gave was, you know, shout out to Jeff Ball. He's where, you know, wherever he is, uh, uh, that dude is awesome. But, um, you know, they teach you in flight training um, that in, there's two critical phases of flight. There's your takeoff and your landing. And they are subsequently the time when the airplane is going the slowest. Which means that you're going slow, flight is harder to or lift is harder to achieve. Yeah. Well, that's they tell you the most. This is the most dangerous, right? You don't have time for error. If you something fucks up and you're in the sky, you got time to figure out what it is and fix it and reroute and do this and the scary. The scariest thing, and I can tell you from experience, the scariest thing is having a situation happen on takeoff. And it's happened numerous amount of times. Once the and and we notice, especially you know, in in, in single engine airplanes, uh, if the engine hasn't been running long enough, um, you know, if it's a cold engine, and you're starting to put, you know, so those engines are not like your car engine. Your car engine's designed to go through R the RPM curve, you know, because you're constantly hitting the gas, taking your foot off the gas, putting your foot on the gas, taking it off the gas. Well, the airplane. The engines are designed completely different. The engines are designed to be constantly ran at a single RPM. So, you know, you get it full and it's designed to run at full power. So you get that full power, you hit it. If something happens, it's you're putting, you, you know, a lot of stress on that engine, you know, going through that RPM curve, you know, especially even in, even in taxing, you know, I mean, you're hitting... And it might be negligible, you know, you might hit, you know, 500, 600 RPMs to get, you know, the prop moving enough to pull you, you know, down along the runway. But then you will, you'll always notice when you do a run up, you always notice when there's, and that's why we do them. But, you know, constantly time and time again, you can read of, of guys that are, you know, getting haste and, um, you, you know, the, 
they're trying to beat weather, they're trying to beat a storm, you know, they open their flight plan too early, so they're trying to get out, you know, they're doing things too quickly, you know, they don't go do the run up, they get in takeoff and then, you know, go to floor it, everything seems fine, they rotate, they get off the ground, you know, 700, 800 feet, engine shuts off, engine quits. Um, and it, that's the scariest thing, you know, and I've seen it happen. Uh, I've been in uh, uh, an airplane that was ill-maintained. We didn't actually know that uh, when they were sending them back to maintenance that the guys, you know, they weren't cleaning any of the spark plugs. Um, you know, like the, 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 they were just, you know, taking them out, looking at them, saying, oh, okay, yeah, they look good, and putting them back in, tightening them up, you know, uh, that we go to pick the airplane up. Um, and it was actually one of the airplanes that, uh, um, my dad had gotten into a partnership with, um, we go to pick the airplane up. I was, uh, with the owner, the, you know, one of my dad's buddies and, uh, we go to take off, realize, you know, this thing's got, it ran up fine, but you could feel yourself like is it, it would feel like it was having the climb like actually climb, you know, the, the engine just, I mean, it, it might say the, you know, all the, ten, everything looked good on it, but they come to find out that, uh, they hadn't inspected the motor. They hadn't inspected the engine. They hadn't looked at it. They, we don't even think they had done a compression test on it. Cause the, I mean, the cylinders, they were, they were terrible. Um, you, you know, my dad kind of got in a, a situation when they tried to sue the company. It was a whole, it was a mess. Um, so we got ended up getting out of that airplane. Um, so anyways, um, all of this leads back to the training, you, you know, that the, when you first start taking your flight training, they, they, that's what they teach you. Those are your basics. Okay. You know, aviate, navigate, communicate. So on the day in question that I'm talking about, I, and here's where I made, you know, the worst errors. So I aviated. Okay, good, cool. You know, I achieved that. Did I communicate? No, I didn't. What does aviate mean? So fly. That means okay, fly. you got in the air. Yeah, I got in the air. I got in the air. But I had no way of communicating with anybody. Why? Well, I didn't have, so that airplane doesn't have lights. There's no radios. There's, okay. and I didn't bring my phone with me. Okay. So when, so if anything were to happen, there would be no way for me to communicate that I was in any type of distress other than given the international sign of distress, which is wagging your wings. Oh, I thought that was, that was, ah. well, I mean, <laughs> generally speaking, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, that it that's would my, be that's my version. It, yeah, it would be. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, so, but you knew there was nobody coming in. You said you yeah, checked. No, yeah. Well, and I didn't even think, I mean, it was, it was sleepy that morning. There wasn't anybody there, you know, um, I, I the flight school wasn't open cause they weren't going to be flying, but right. one of the instruct, but one of their instructors had been. So, uh, I do these three, three ground runs. Okay. I'm testing. And here's what I was looking for. So there's no manual that comes with this thing. Right. So there's no, you know, if somebody was like, well, well, what's the speed it takes off at? Well, I don't know. So I have to build that manual. I have to, to, I have to take it across the ground. I have to see at what speed the, can, the tail comes up because it's a tail dragger, mm -hmm. which means the tail, you know, drags across the ground. Um, I have to see what speed the controls come active, uh, see what the maximum stopping distance is, you know, what the effective, uh, um, what, what the effective stall speed would be, you know, where's my initial area stall. I've got to do all those calculations and, you know, luckily because, you know, there's so many home built airplanes now, um, there's so much support for this. They actually have a, you can, you know, download it offline. It's, there's a whole calculator, you know, it's a whole, you know, table that you go through, you know, when you're flight testing and everybody that home builds an airplane, you know, that even, you know, if it's their own design, um, you know, they'll do this. And so, you know, I had somebody ask me, they're like, well, so why didn't you get somebody else to do it? You didn't have a pilot's license. Why didn't, you know, um, why didn't you? Well, because here's the thing. And, you, you know, call me selfish or, or whatever, but I built this. My hands were on this. If I don't 
take it across the ground myself, I can't. If and obviously something happened, right? So there was a problem. So my thought pattern was correct. Uh, if I give the keys, you know, to like, let's say I give the keys to my buddy, you know, and I say, hey, you know, here, go take it across the ground. You know, you right. have a pilot's license. You can do this. But and he gets in a situation, he panics, kills himself. I got to live with that. I'm not. That I can't have that on my conscience. I'm sorry. I I, I literally it that was like I I, co- I can't I couldn't. And right. so if I'm not willing to test it myself, I'm not willing to fly it. I'm not willing to give it you, you know a what for. Even if I'm not going to take it in the air because I, my intention wasn't to fly it. You know, my intention was just to see you know just to do this calculation sheet that I had. And I you know I had a finite time to do it in because you know there's rain coming. There was a you know rainstorm coming. So, uh, on, I, I did, you know, three across the ground and on my fourth one, I got brave. So I had been doing these at like 30% power. So I wasn't giving it, you know, I wasn't taking it through the whole RPM curve. I wasn't, um, I wasn't going very fast. I was just, you know, trying, I was just going through the first, you know, page of the calculation sheet, which is like three pages. So right. on my fourth one, I got brave. And I said, well, I was like, I've been doing these at 30% power. I was like, I wonder what 100% power feels like. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to, th- my thought was throttle forward, see if you can pop the tail up. If you can pop your tail up, throttle back, see if, see if you can get any type of reading off of that. Okay, see, count. You know, see how long you can hold the tail up. See if you can hold, you know, see if the brakes will hold, you know, well enough that you can hold your tail up. Right. See if you see what your brake authority is. So that was all I was going to do. Well, when I firewalled it, I let go of the brakes and I went to go hit them. And I went to go pull the throttle back and the throttle just like shook in my hand. Like it had, there was nothing (laughs) and it was stuck at full. And so I was like. Well, don't hit the brakes because then you're going to send the nose into the ground. Just go. Figure it out. Fly your plane. So that's what I did. Because at this point, like, I can move this thing and it's not going to do anything. I mean, I can shake it like this. It was, you know, I could do this with it. Right. And it just, so what had happened is, is the throttle cable had come out of the actuator that's on the top. And the reason why is because the cable was too short. There was a bend in it already. Um, it must have got damaged when they had pulled the cable out of the jet ski that they had it in. And my it system wasn't, just it wasn't mm-hmm. that the duct tape came off. Uh, no, no, certainly wasn't. The duct tape helped by the way, duct tape worked. <laughs> I mean the thing flew. I understand. Um, so what happened? So you're now you you're airborne. Well, so at yeah, so throttle. at How like fix that? eighteen knots. Eighteen knots I became active. Well, I had I had only put a gallon of gas in this thing. That's a so plus. at some well, point. Yeah. It's gonna... Well, it, it that was my thought. So I was like, okay, well, you know, you can't do anything with the throttle. The fuel shut off. If you want to get to the fuel shut off, I can't. I have to take my hands off the controls. I have to reach up because so the motor sat like here on it. So mm-hmm. I would have to reach up. I'd have to grab it, and I'm gonna burn myself on the exhaust. Because it's all it's it's all over here. All where the fuel stuff all is is you know right where the carb and then taking all that stuff is. And I would burn myself. There's a hundred percent chance of that. So I wasn't willing to take that risk. I can't shut the key off because if I shut the key off, then I'm going to lose you know the en- I'm going to lose the engine power. So de- over a densely populated area, that's a no go. Right. If I shut the engine off right after it it lifted, I'm going to crash into that field. And this is September. It hadn't rained. That's a cornfield. They had just plowed, you know, all that corn. There's still remnants. It's going to cause a fiery mess. And I didn't want to be that guy. Um, So I decided I was like, all right, well, if the thing's flying, I can get airborne. I said, I'm going to overfly the terminal and I'm going to wag my wings. And it's exactly what I did. And that's what they nailed me for. And that's what they continue to try to hammer me for today. 
Well, that airport, so they have, uh, it's a little, the, the guy that, that, that bought it, he built a, you know, a, a better terminal that he put like a little restaurant in there and he never moved his fuel tanks. So his fuel tanks are like, you know, less than a hundred feet away from, you know, his front entrance. Well, I, when I took off, you know, I could see that there was somebody that had walked out and he had his ha- phone in his hand and he, he was, you know, pointing it up at me. So I'm like, all right, well, he's recording this. So I wag my wings at him. I guess he thinks I'm doing, you know, stunts or something with this thing. I don't to this day. And he there's no there was nothing on the record that he said, or at least that they gave to me, you know, when I asked for it. That, you know, all, all they all that they had was the video and, you know, and the videos, oh, you can hear him say, oh, my God, look at this idiot. And so it looked like he was filming it for YouTube while I wagged my wings at him. Nobody called. Nobody went and got help. Right. Nobody, you know, nobody, you know, you would think somebody in the, looks like they're in distress you know, they're flying super low. First of all, I, I only climbed up to about 170 foot because I didn't want, you know, I can hear the hardware that hadn't been safety wired yet jingling. Right. And so it was like just the amount of fear and panic I was I was in. And I was like, all right, you know, just figure out a way to get this thing down on the ground. So I overfly the terminal once I turn around. And I try to land on the the paved runway. Well, I can see the paved runway's wet. And I'm like, I'm not gonna if I don't make this, if I if I if I overshoot this, I'm going into to route route uh, I think that's route two. And that's a major thoroughfare. I don't wanna, you know, plow into the ground. If I come in it from the other way, I'm gonna be fighting a tailwind coming in. And yeah, you can get down, but if I don't stop enough, I'm going in the route too. If I don't, if I come this way, I don't stop well enough. I'm going into the railroad tracks. That's even worse. I said, so this is going to end up bad now. So I was like, all right, well, I'm going to abandon that. So I tried to come back around. And I tried to land into the wind because the wind had shifted at this point. Um, you know, cause this, this rainstorm is now approaching, like it's starting to rain at where I was at at 170 foot, there was moisture. So, and I'm just like, all right. I, and I, I look up and I'm like, all right, coach, so do I have enough gas? You, you know, can I make a turn? You know, cause if I turn that fuel is going to slosh, you know, is it going to miss the pickup? And then, you know, am I going to get into a, a situation like this is, it's bad, right? <laughs> So I, I did the only thing I, I, I could think to do is um, I turned back around. So there's a criminal justice academy that I know in the, the, the field house. And they're both at, if you land into the wind, since it had shifted at this point, if I landed into the wind, there's a, a, um, a gate and, and a fence. And I'm going to 100% slam into the fence. Because there's no time for me to stop. Because that grass runway is super short. It's built for airplanes like I'm flying. On a on a normal day, no wind. You know, your stopping distance is fine. So I was like, all right, well, I'm going to go and I'm going to risk. Because the grass runway kind of intersects the, the the bottom end of the of the real runway, the paved runway. Right. Um, and uh, I said, all right, I'm going to risk you know, a runway incursion, I'm going to risk, you know, hitting that runway because at least if I hit that runway, I can stop then because the pavement's kind of up on a, on a little bit of a grade. Right. I said, you you know, that's going to give me something to stop just in case I have a brake failure. And I said, you know, worst case scenario, I can get it on the ground, ground loop it, and that'll stop me, you know, quick enough. You know, you might do a little bit of damage, but you know, you'll stop fast enough. And that's exactly what I did. I came back around. As soon as I came back around, I killed the engine. And I said, all right, this is a paper airplane now. I said, what, you, what you've what you got is what you get. And so I, I came in, porpoised a little bit. I, boun- I I hit the ground, I bounced, and then I immediately induced a ground loop. And the reason I, w- and like I said, uh, you know, I, I wanted to, you know, I didn't want to hit the brakes. I didn't want to risk a brake failure. 
you know, I didn't want to get 5606 hydraulic fluid all over me. I mean, that would kind of stink. This is already a bad enough day. And if I, if I stop and I start to slide because it's wet now, because there's moisture, if I start to slide, I'm going to end up nosing it over and I'm going to do damage. So I was like ground looping. It's the easiest way. Yeah. I might, I might touch a wing, whatever. Did absolutely no damage to the airport. Did absolutely no damage to the airplane. Got the airplane back. Pulled it all apart. Seen exactly what had happened. We, I called, you know, the FAA. I told the FAA what the problem was. You know, they they asked me, you know, hey, you know, what happened? And told them what happened. They said, all right, anybody so die? Do they know what's happened? Like no, as, they had no idea. In, so you're calling in, telling, saying this is what just happened. Just want to let you guys know. Nobody's actually called in. Nobody's called and nobody made any type of report. But you assume somebody has. I thought somebody would have. Yeah, I, I thought somebody would have. Okay. I didn't know nobody did. I didn't know the report didn't get made for uh, four months, I think. Okay. Um. So, yeah, so I, I didn't I had no idea. Um. The report got in, so uh, this it's a, it's a it's a whole web, but uh, they um, they asked me the FAA was like, so what happened? We explained the situation. He was like, okay, what's the tail number? And we're like, well, it's not registered. And he's like, okay, anybody get hurt? Nope. Anybody die? Nope. Did you do any damage? Nope. Okay, why are you calling? Right. Just doing due diligence. Just want to let you know. They're like, well, the airplane's not registered. You know, nobody's called us and complained. Cool. You know, I'll note it. Don't do that again. You know, just be warned. Have a nice day. And I was like, all right, well, that was super simple. That was super easy. Right. You know, I didn't think anything of it. Um, and I guess, uh, so I'm coming out of the D. Well, so I had gone to the DMV that uh, the. So this is, I guess I'm jumping around here a little bit. Like, um, you know, we took the airplane apart. Uh, you know, we put. Um, there were some things that we're gonna fix. You know, we now now it knew now I know it flies. Now I know it's a, it, it can be safe. You just got to fix a bunch of things. You just got to finalize a bunch of things. It can't be safe. But Steve had run into some problems with, I guess he had some employee issues and some things. And uh, um, his he was in the process of changing that uh, dealership over to his daughter and trying to retire so he can fly more. And, and, and you know, so him and his brother can get, you know, more airplanes and things like that, um, you know, get deeper into this aviation community. Um, so they kind of abandoned that project and then, you know, subsequently they were like, well, we'll we're going to, we're going to close this hangar down, um, at, at Shannon, uh, airport. Um, and we're just going to move everything over to Stafford. So then that's what they ended up doing. Um, I had gone to work, uh, during, you know, right after then, um, for another car dealership working as a mechanic, um, and, uh, I was working on the side on the weekends, uh, detailing airplanes. Um, and so that's why it's the, the company that, 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 um, Steve had started for me was outlaw aviation. Um, and we How thought, appropriate. It, yeah, well, it, it was a joke. It, it was, you know, it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be a play on words and fun. It wasn't actually supposed to be, you know, what it, uh, what it happened, but it, it is ironic, you know, it, right. you know, it is, it, it is funny. Um, and, you know, I went without any issue, you know, in aviation for, um, you know, 2018, 2000, you know, the end of 2018, all of 2019, um, till December, 2019, uh, I made a fake piece of paper. Um, I made a fake flight plan, um, to justify, uh, me not going to a probation meeting to a probation officer. And, uh, this dude, I was so fucking stupid. Uh, and so she submitted that even though it wasn't real and that, that, you know, that, that document, you know, really didn't, 
I, I mean, there there wasn't any real real cause for concern to take for her to take it, to, you know, to the level that she did. But then that's that got them to start looking at me again. And then I guess they were thinking I was escalating and, you know, my criminal behavior and stuff. And I guess they they wanted to intervene. So who is they? Uh, well, at first it was um, the sheriff's department. Okay. Um, so they come to me for uh, unauthorized use of a vehicle and tampering with airplanes charge um, for something that they think happened at, at, at a Stafford airport. Well, they get the airports mixed up and they get the airports confused, you know, just because of how close in proximity they are to each other. They both start with S's. Um, and so that case, uh, they, 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 they take it to, to trial or they, they take me to, to the plea. You know, they arrest me for it. They give okay. me like, ten, yeah, they give me 10 charges. And it's all these things, and then there's all these different reports, and there's all these different little things, there's different little tidbits, and it's all just the people that they talk to. And so the, their case is completely jumbled around. They go to, they, you know, take me to the, we, we try to do the whole discovery thing. I wave all this BS because I'm like, I'm not, I told him, I said, listen, I said, I'm going to wave, you, you know, the pretrial conference and all that stuff. But what you're going to give me in return is, as I say, you're going to take away all this. And I said, I'll cop out to an unauthorized use of an airplane. I said, that's simple. I said, because when I go and I look through the charge sheet, that's the lowest grade of all these felonies that you've got me with. I said, yeah, I'll take that. And then they're like, OK, cool. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to give you a tampering with airplanes, too. And I'm like, okay, whatever. That's a, uh, uh, you know, high grade misdemeanor at that, you know? And so, uh, they give me, they say, why they, are you not allowed to tamper with? Are you not allowed? Where, how no, are you tampering it, with? I, well, they said, don't, don't you have a license to be a mechanic? N well, so I'm not an AMP. I'm not a licensed AMP. I'm an apprentice, okay. but no, I don't have a mechanic certificate, but you don't need one. Like to for all that issue, you didn't need one. Okay. Um. You know, I mean, the, the countless people, you know, that aren't that aren't licensed mechanics build airplanes every day. You know, I've got a ton of friends that started, you know, building their airplane, and then that's how they got their mechanics license. Right. Just because okay. of how long it took them to build their airplane. Um. But yeah, so uh, February nineteenth of 2020 they i go to probation to the probation officer had had set up an, a meeting for me and so she calls me in and says uh hey you, you, you know um you're doing some programs and things you know we need to talk about that you know i need to get a drug test on you all these things and so i'm like all right well as soon as i pulled into the parking lot this and I got out of my truck. This guy that's and he looked homeless. You know, he's got long scruffy hair. You know, it was still kind of cloudy. Um, you, you know, February is kind of cloudy in in Northern Virginia, and uh, you know, he had uh like glasses on and you know like a dirty t shirt and he had you know paint stained jeans and everything. But I looked at it in his hand and he's got a fucking iPhone. Right. And so I'm like, well, they don't, you know, and it's like a newer iPhone. It's not like an older iPhone. And so every time I would go out and I would smoke a cigarette, I waited in that, that, that office in the weight room. So I go into the probation office, sign in and everything. I wait in that weight room for way longer than I should have. And it didn't click to me. Nothing, you know, I wasn't thinking, you know, and I certainly wasn't looking out in the parking lot like I should have been for all the cop cars that were coming in. Right. So, um, every time I went, I, I had enough time to go out and smoke two cigarettes, you know, not, you know, one right after the other, you know, I went out, smoked every time I would go out, this homeless looking dude would follow me. And so the second time I'm coming back in, I look and I see his fingernails. And I'm like, Oh shit. I'm like, I'm like, he must be, I said, something's going on here. First of all, I'm waiting too long. 
you know, so I go back up to the window and I said, Hey, I was like, you know, they need to do a drug test. Can you get a mail out here so I can go ahead and, and, and do this? Cause I got to use the bathroom. I've been waiting here for almost an hour now. So they do that. They do the drug test. They, you know, they get that done. I'm like, all right, cool. Check. At least, you know, if for some reason she's got something going on, she has to reschedule it. I've at least got that off and they can see I reported. Right. Um, cause they were real bad about the sign and logs there. Like, I mean, you could sign in and then, you know, get a probation violation. And they're like, oh, well, you never signed in. Well, where's the log? Oh, well, we don't have it. Um, right. So, lo and behold, uh, I go back into her office. I'm sitting in her office. And she was playing the part well. Um, she's like, yeah, you know, I'm talking to me about my programs. And then all of a sudden, you know, six D- the Department of Transportation agents in flag jackets and their rifles and everything come in. and make a scene right i mean they make a spectacle well they take me they take me into the conference room and first of all they're like uh so you know we have a a warrant for your arrest um you you know and they 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 do all the reading of the rights and all that that nonsense and so i'm personal and i'm looking at their jackets i'm like department of transportation i'm like it's not clicking to me at this point because they they hadn't told me what i'm arrested for all they told me was that i was under arrest so they they take me back into a conference room and they sent me down. And they're like, OK, so uh, we have a warrant for your arrest for operation of an aircraft without a valid airman certificate. Um, and uh, we have this video. We're going to plug it in. We're going to we're going to watch this video. And I and um, they're like, we're going to get this camera out. And do you want to make any statement? And I said, oh, no. I said, what happens from here? And he said, oh, well, we have to go and we have to take you. We have to arraign you. And then you're going to get a, b- a bail hearing um, this afternoon. And I said, oh, bail hearing? Okay, cool. I said, I want nothing to do with you guys. I don't care to talk to you. I don't want to make any statements. I said, because you're going to use anything I say and take it completely out of context. I said, let's just let's just go and sort this out. And so that's what right. I did. So I got arrested. Right there from the probation office, they take me into uh, Alexandria, the fourth, uh, the Eastern District. Um, and they arraign me um, and then give me no bail. And he right. said, no, nope. he said, I'm not going to give you any bond. He said, um, you know, you, you don't have uh, an address that's local. Um, you don't have uh, your, your jobs out of state. Because I would travel to Maryland to go work on airplanes. Right. Um, Gatorburg, but I'm living in Northern Virginia. Um, they're, they're like, yeah, you know, you're not inside the district. Um, we're not going to let you out. So I'm like, shit. Well, we had heard that there was some type of, you know, some boogeyman, some some spooky thing coming or happening. You know, I th- first heard about, I, I seen one article that mentioned Corona and I liked Corona beer. So I, I thought that that had mentioned, I didn't had no idea that there would, you know, be so, you know, I keep pushing them, keep pushing them, keep pushing them. And I'm like, can you guys just put me into like a halfway house? I right. said, is there somewhere? So they, they found an Oxford house that was close to where I was living. Um, I, I knew somebody down there that had, you know, local work. Um, and so I was like, can I get at least put on an ankle monitor? And uh, March 12th, they, so we're hearing about the pandemic going on. So March 12th, right. they um, tell me, okay, well, you can be put on an ankle monitor, but you got to wait, be evaluated, and then they got to come and do it. And that could take up to two weeks you have a week to get into this halfway house. So let's hope that they, that, that they, they take, you know, play, play ball. And March 23rd, the day before they shut the fucking government down. And we're hearing about this, like the courts weren't, that nobody was in court. Um, luckily they had a, a, you know, they, they had a case officer that, and she, she was always on her job. Um, she came out and put the ankle monitor on me and then took me out to the halfway house and I got put on uh, and then, you know, the world shut down and then everything changed for everybody. So, um, it, they, 
I should have taken. The problem is, is, is that I'm 100% guilty of flying an airplane without a license. <laughs> That's well, always and, a problem. And, and, well, and I don't. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I did yeah, well, it. You're I did guilty. It. You're in a really bad spot. Well, yeah, you're in a bad not... spot if you're not guilty, but you're in a much, much worse spot if you are guilty. Well, and I didn't want to fight them on that. You know, right. I mean, they were already asking at at that point. The the prosecutor, I, he's a new guy. And, you know, I mean, he was trying his hand with every single thing he could try to use against me. Um, and I, to, I mean, to their credit, I gave them all the ammo they needed. They had all the infinity stones. So, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it wasn't hard for them to make me out to be a monster. But the problem is, is that he really pushed very hard. Um to say that I was influenced by um, the, I was influenced by the things in Jan 6th uh, to, to say that I was influenced. Yeah. Oh yeah. He, he tried all of it. Um, he tried coming up with this. I mean, they, they tried to, 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 I did two search histories on what Jan 6 even was because right. I mean, I was on house arrest. I couldn't, I mean, I didn't, uh, you know, I would go to work during the day. We heard about it. I mean, we knew that something was happening in the government, but we didn't know what it was, you know, and this whole time I'm only being told, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, going to be put on, uh, probation. You know, I had my lawyers like, oh man, you know, the last person that did this, he got 10 days, you know, they're not going to, it's, this is, this is nothing. Well, then. He stands up in court and says, oh, well, you know, he, he he makes his, you know, closing statement says he flew over our nation's capital. And that's where the fucking and the, the reporter was this little fucking chick sitting back in the back. This, this uh, and just on her notepad, just jotting stuff down. And so that they they spun that narrative. Um, there's other articles I can go back and find them. I've got, I've been able to get one taken down. The one that said that I flew over the white house. Yeah, they're That's, just blatantly lying. They're just, Oh, well, yeah. Well, I mean, so they, they, they say that I, I flew over the, the, the white house in an airplane that had 18,000 gallons worth of gas, but only weighed 300 pounds. All right. Uh, I, I mean, they, they contradict themselves in the article and, and make themselves look bad. Um, but what the main claim was is that they said that I recklessly operated an aircraft um, with negligent uh, disregard for human life. Um, because they say that I, I flew because I flew over the terminal. Well, the government tried to hit. I what my suspicion is is the government tried to hit uh, the airport with a fine because their fuel tanks are too close to the terminal, which they really are. I mean, if you look at what they're they should be. I'm pretty sure that they make enough money. They just pay the fine every year. So I think that they put pressure on them because they made the claim that I, that uh, I flew. If I, they were trying to say that in court, they said, "Oh, uh, if he would have wrecked into the, to you, you know those fuel tanks, it would have been it would been like a nuclear explosion." Well, first of all, that's completely fucking false. If I'd have hit that fuel tank, that fuel tank, I'm splattered on it that's what's going to happen you know i mean those fuel right. tanks are built to be hit they right. actually they i mean they, they pressured that there's trust me i'm not going to do anything to them but fucking splatter right on them right um and they said that you know they made the claim and you know so yeah i get why they why they said that i acted in disregard um just because the the I should have never flown the airplane. Absolutely. I should have never been there that day, you, you know, trying to ground test it and trying to do all these things. But they make that they make this claim that, um, and what I've been fighting with them on tooth and nail and constantly, and I'll go to the mattresses for it is that, um, they said that I should have shut the airplane. It's the government's official position at the end of all this, that I should have shut the airplane off in that critical phase of flight. And they tried to set a precedent with it. Okay. So that means that they're trying to set a training precedent with it, which means that they are that they can use my case in other cases, right? In other instances to prove a point. 
And they've been trying to do this slowly to, you know, airplane builders and ultralight guys in the backcountry. They're actually trying to stop backcountry flying now. Um, There's a huge push and there's actually legislation um, to save it uh, going through now. Um, But, you know, they had a bunch of guys that came in uh, from the FAA that were not pilots that had no idea um, what they were really even talking about and they were testifying to a judge that didn't want to hear it because he uh, was a 33 year naval aviator who hadn't been hadn't flown anything in 40 years or stepped foot on an airplane probably in 40 years right Uh, and i think judge ellis was a salty 92 year old guy you know right um, and he thought he had all the answers and, you know, he even said, I'm making an example of you. And, uh, the prosecutor asked for 36 months, which is the statutory maximum for that charge. Um, and he cut it in half and gave me two years. I mean, I guess that's not in half. I mean, he went over it. Yeah. He, he, <laughs> he, he went over years. it. I mean, he, he, he How gave you what he was a break. Uh, all together? Yeah. Probably 10 years of my life. No, I mean on that oh. charge. Oh, I did all, I did the entire time. You did the whole 24 months? You didn't get oh. any t- time off for good, good time? They don't give time to terrorists in, in BOP. Oh. <laughs> what were you charged with? Operation of an aircraft without a valid airman certificate. That's not, that's not terrorism. Well, no, it's not. But in the pre-sentence report that the BOP got... They said that I, ex- I I displayed terroristic activity and a terroristic mindset when I did this. Uh, okay. They said they tried to say that I was suicidal and that I was trying. Their, their their official claim, and I never said this at all, ever, 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 ever. And I never made the I never made the distinction. You, you know, I told them that I had, you know, some some health disturbances and they used that against me. Um, I, I told they, they said um, that because of how close it was in proximity to September 11th when I did this. That I must be operating for terrorism and they went through all of So they went back and got all. All of my computers, all of my phones, all of my digital documents, and used that precedent to push their case off for months. I had to, to surrender all of my electron. I had to get like a new phone. I had to surrender everything to them, all of my stuff. And they tried to they 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 tried to make a link. And luckily, Jan six hadn't happened at that point, but that was early on in the pre sentencing phase. Um, right after you, you, you know, you get, you have to go for all their little conferences and everything. And then they yeah, certify yeah. the indictment and all that shit. And then they're like, okay, well now we're going to go into the pre-sentencing phase. Now we're going to get all the investigation on you. When they did the investigation, you know, they, they've said I had the mental disturbances, but then, you know, they made an emergency hearing and said, okay, well, you know, we want to link them to terrorism. So, all right, cool. Well, they, they weren't ever able to officially make that, that distinction in court. But the BOP makes a distinction anyways. And to them, that's all that matters because they're going to be the ones that supervise you. They're going to be the ones that, you know, book you in. They're going to be the ones that live scan you. They're going to be the ones that. And that's what they did. So when they live scanned me, they put me in live scan. They put me in live scan as domestic terrorist. And I have to. So now anytime that I get pulled over, anytime I get arrested, it's anytime they do a background check on me. Uh, so, I mean, so what if you get pulled over, a cop says the fuck's uh, this charge? Uh, the, <laughs> no, they, they don't ever ask anymore. They just get out with their gun drawn. It, I mean, it could be, it could be a simple traffic stop and yeah, they, they, so I got pulled over a month ago because I was doing 80 in a 55. Right. Um, I was driving my Mustang cop got out of his car immediately pulled his weapon driver with your you know left hand you know throw your keys out of the window you know i'm approaching the vehicle you're put your hands out the window 
you know, keep your hands out the window until I tell you to, pulls me out, immediately detains me. What, a, what, what, for what? Oh, yeah, by the way, you're a domestic terrorist. And I said, no, I'm certainly not. And he said, well, the computer says you are. And it's what I got to go on. And he said, I just want to let you know I got to write you a ticket. You're doing 80 and a 55. And I'm like, well, but was all this necessary? Was all this necessary? And he said, oh, yeah, well, I don't know you. And so I, in, in a way, I get it. But, I mean, they got, like, I, there's no way to get it off. There's nothing I can do. Nobody right. wants to take nobody wants to take on the, the, the civil rights case about it. And here's something else that they don't know. Um you know, they make so that article comes out, I get a probation violation for because in the halfway house, um, I smoked a little bit of weed. Um, right. And uh, you know, I I admitted to it. I told the probation officer when she drug tested me, I was like, Yeah, you know, is there gonna be there it might pop for THC, you, you know, and she was like, okay, what happened? Blah, blah, blah. And she was like, well, you know, I got to submit the report. Judge Ellis immediately was like, well, I'm going to arrest you. So January, I think it's January 12th of 2021, they get, they finally, you know, they, they, they lock me up, um, put me, uh, in, um, so Alexandria had COVID. The entire jail had COVID. Um, so they couldn't put me there. So they put me in a private jail in Warsaw, Virginia. They put me in, um, uh, Northern Neck Regional Jail. So my first day there, um, now I had been on seizure medication. I had been on, and I didn't, I never had seizures. They used Depakote off label for bipolar. Okay. Well, the, the amount of Depakote I was taking a day was like 3000 milligrams, which is a lot. So it was really affecting my liver. But if they take you off of it and you don't have it, it can actually induce seizures. Right. Well, so I told them I need this medication. I need the medication I came in with. You know, we I brought my stuff with me. You know, why are you not giving me my medication? And I got kind of verbally assaultive with the with the, the guard because the guy came up, you know, he had his mask on and everything, and he was he cussing at me and everything. I'm like, yo, dude, I didn't even cuss at you or nothing. I'm like, I'm behind this door. You're like, you're aggressing on to me. I said, I'm mad about the fact that I don't have my medicine and I could have seizures because I'm not being weaned off of this medication. And he's like, oh, well, I don't know nothing about that, nor do I care. You know, you're in here and you just deal with it. You know, I'll get medical for you when, when they come around for pill call. I'm like, she's like standing right there, dude. You know, like, let me talk to her and ask her something. And so, and I reached my hand out the gate and I, I pointed, I was like, and he, I guess he, he thought I was going to grab him or whatever. Well, so then he calls for his buddies and, you know, he calls assault on an officer. And so they come fucking running and there's like six or seven of them. So they beat me into three seizures in the cell. They shatter my orbital. Um, uh, yeah, broke my nose, uh, I'm supposed to be in court the next morning on video for my detention hearing. They can't, they have to push that back because now I, they have to take me to the hospital. So they hit my head because they, they carried me like a lawn chair. Right. Um, you know, out of the cell. Um, I was already beat up. My rib was broken. Um, and just for fun, they knock my they knock my head into the the so you know have you ever seen the cells the the pods that have a sally port? Yeah. Mm, well, in this jail, that's a cage. So like they come in through the the main door to the block, then there's that cage, and it's got the so then they hit my head, they ran my head into the cage, into. The, right. I'm, I'm sorry, dude. That's a, it's kind of hard to talk about. Um into the to to the cage to the cell cell cage door and knock me out and i come to when i'm in medical and they're like bring the nurse in and they shut the door and they're like yo what the fuck did you guys do and they're like oh well he was aggressing he you know was trying to reach for the officer and uh the head of medical was like all right well we're gonna sweep this all up underneath the rug get him to the hospital 
and they came back and then I was put in solitary confinement again until I was able to be transported to uh, what about video cameras? There's no video. I can't, the jail won't, the jail won't release it. Nobody wants to take it on. Nobody wants to help. Um, right. I know the, I know some of the guards names. I know one of the, the only decent one, um, her first name's Ashley, but it's spelled A S H L E I G H. Um, she had to sign something for me one day, and I seen the first name. I can't, I can't remember. She has a common like last name, like Johnson or Stanton or something like that. It's one of the common names around there. But uh, she would be. She was the only one that told me. So she told when they brought me back. So I in the hospital, I seized four times. Um, I had to be put out. Um. Uh, they they had to uh, use phenobarbital to put me out. Right. Um, I mean, they fucked me up. They did. They did a bunch of damage. Have um, you tried to do a Freedom of Information Act on the jail? Follow yeah, Freedom they, of Information Act. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think the jail would respond to a FOIA request. Um, the well, I, you, I I had a lawyer friend of mine um, that I that I knew call, and he said. Um, yeah, he said I, I talked to him and they they don't they act like you were never here. They said they don't even have any record of your of you being an inmate or anything. And I said, "Well, what do you mean?" I was like, "That's just somebody that you're talking to." Right. And he said, "Yeah." He's like, "Well, I tried to flex, you, you know, my muscle." And he said, "They don't." That guy does. They, that's I don't believe that. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I mean, either. no, he's a fucking douchebag trying to get you to go away. Um, I would. I would fill out a, a freedom of public records act and freedom of, you know, it's not a, it will. So you were being held what by the feds, but in the County jail, I was being held by the U S marshals. Okay. So it was for the marshal service. Now I called the marshals themselves and I made the claim to the marshals and the marshals acted like they didn't want anything to do with it. It doesn't they're matter. They're like, Oh, well they're, they're like, the never, it doesn't they, matter. They said, it? So you want to hear how, how, listen, listen, Okay, sure. The guy that talks to you on the phone is just some local fucking douchebag. The guy you fill out the Freedom of Information Act is in like Washington. Like he doesn't know what's going on here. What he gets is he has access to like a central archive. So he has no skin in the game. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. He'll sure. just, yeah, yeah. yeah, he'll put in a, a request saying, hey, provide this information. And then they're like, damn, we have to provide him the information to forward on to you. He, they they can't say oh we don't know who that guy is real you you don't know who he is like no no you do know who he is I can tell he was there I need that information they're not gonna lie to him because trust me there's all the time when you go directly to the source and they're like oh they they send something back saying we don't have this information right you don't have any you don't have any information on on, on my case no yeah and this is I've done this for guys in in prison they're like oh we have no record of him you have no record of him there was a three week trial. And a two-year FBI investigation, but you don't know who who he is. You have yeah, no information. So then, of course, you file the Freedom of Information Act with Washington, and mm -hmm. then they come back. Suddenly, you get twenty five hundred documents. Oh wow! Okay, of someone that they didn't know who this person was. Yeah, man. So, imagine that. Yeah, right. So you have to do it. One, you do it to like the jail. You do it to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Or sorry, mm -hmm. not, sorry the state attorney's office you do it to the the um the sheriff of course the sheriff's department you know which is over the jail you do it to the u.s marshals you so you just hammer there and then if they come back if eventually if they come back and say oh we don't know who this is well now you can file something with the court saying i'm having a hard time believing this listen i know guys where they said we don't have anything on this guy and then they filed something with the court and the judge said that's not possible well he so was there it, uh, and, and then I, they fill it. And I'm wondering, and I, the, the thing about this jail is, and this jail is notorious for this, the marshals actually were going to pull their contract. So it's a contract jail. Yeah. And I, they're not a, a technical, they're not a law enforcement agency because there's no, nobody over, there's no like oversight. There's no police department, sheriff's department over them. It's not, they're just a regional jail. There's a jail administration. So they have like a, a warden or what they call a superintendent. And they got they have all that, but it's not like a real law enforcement agency. Okay, even if it was a private facility, it's still empowered okay. by the state. They okay. have to respond. They can't okay. say, "Oh no, no, we're privately owned." 
We're not law enforcement. We're privately owned. We don't have to respond. The hell you don't. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Like, trust me, they all have to respond. Periodically, okay. somebody will be, you know, a douchebag and think he's going to be cute. And, and mm-hmm. so what happens is 95% of the people just go away. Well, right. if you continue on at some point, and then you get to use all that. You get to say, right. look, send them this. This is the letter they sent back. Apparently sure. I, I was never there, you know, sent this here. Then they responded. Oh, look, I was there for 120 days. Oh, look, I did go to the hospital. Oh, look, mm-hmm. I did this. I did all this. You know, they're covering it up. And the perfect example of that is that when my first few requests were all denied, I wasn't right. even here. Sure. What better proof that they're trying to cover up than to say, oh, he, we don't have any, we don't know who this person is really. Cause two months later, you provided, you know, 82 pages of who I was. Right, right, right. So you really want them to deny it and go forward and say, you, you tried to stop this at every possible, um, at every possible opportunity. You tried to kibosh this whole thing. And then what you get to say is, so if you're willing to lie about me being there and you only responded to a federal judge saying you had to do it, mm-hmm. then what's the... You know, what was, what's to stop you from dummying up the reports? Sure. Yeah. Which yeah. And that's, and, and that's the other thing I'm worried about too, because they're the, the jail's famous for doing that as well. Right. So, well, um, you still have to move, you still move forward, especially if you can get a hold of tapes. It's even better. Your honor, I, in the, in the, um, in the, uh, motion, which by the way, can be two pages. Like you don't mm-hmm. have to, you don't have to be eloquent to file that motion. You can write it in green crown. I want to get yeah. under, you know, you can do the yeah. whole, you don't have to be sure. Eloquent. Yeah. And they're, they're okay. going to respond like, absolutely. He has every right to get this. So what I'm saying is if you request the, the tapes and then they say, Oh, those tapes were erased. We don't have those tapes. Wow. Mm-hmm. Now, imagine like, that doesn't that. look yeah. good either. Okay. It's like every step that you're trying to cover up, I want to see the tapes because I know the tapes show this. And then, and I know that you got, they're covering it up. Oh, we don't have the tapes. Mm-hmm. You didn't know who I was during the phone call. My mm-hmm. lawyer, you co- told him you didn't know who I was. The first time I made a report in writing, you said you didn't know who it was. You finally provided the, uh, uh, the information that showed that I was there. We asked for the tapes, which I said you were trying to cover up. You said they were erased. Sure. Amazing. Like, then you say, okay, I want to move forward. And then you try and go for like a civil case. And then, you know what? Then they come to you and say, look, let's give you 10 grand. Just go away. Mm-hmm. We don't, not that we're doing anything, but we don't want to have to, we pay attorneys and, and, yeah, and, and then right. you can start arguing. Then it's like, yeah. no, I want half a million. And then they go, ah, oh, it's not going to happen. Uh, we might be able to get you 15,000. You see what I'm saying? Like you go sure, back and sure. forth. And that's okay. typically, if you get to that stage, that's typically when a lawyer suddenly steps forward and says, my God, of course I'll help you. Oh yeah, sure. Because they're oh, already yeah. making offers. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. Oh, and they're, I, they're, I wish you told me this earlier. I would have helped you the whole way. No, you wouldn't have. Sure. Sure. No, you're ready to step in and because you know, this is going to be four phone calls and a mediation and okay. you're going to get me a check for 50 grand and you're going to mm-hmm. take 20% of that. You know, they're going to take 10 grand and that's yeah. worth, that's worth four phone calls and four hours of negotiation, you know, so it's worth 10 grand yeah. and then they're going to take any cost out of your end. So yeah. there's another 500 to a thousand dollars. Right. But that's the best you've got coming, but you right. have to pursue it. Oh, I'm 1000% done. And that's, you know, that's kind of why I'm on this little bit of crusade that I am because, uh, you know, the prison system is messed up the 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 bop i mean i so i was in during covid which was just the worst sure. thing possible right well yeah and so i mean like our access to commissary was was bad so i was i, I went to uh, fci loretto um they had me at um the usp first and i was there for a while um uh, I went to the receiving and all that, all the adjustments um, that they do. And they, they, they bounce you around in different placements. Um, and then Loretto is where uh, finally they, they found a bed for us um, and uh, they shipped. So it was like five of us, you know, ended up going there and that the, see the problem with that place is, is, is that, 
you, you know, yeah, it might be a low level place, but it's where they put gang members. They have a gang unit there, um, which they are trying. They try to do programs to reform them, but they don't really do anything. It just gives them a place to congregate. Um, and uh, they have a sex offender program there, so it's all where the sex offenders go. And so, right. it was real hard for me because I'm a you know smaller white dude you know um i'm coming in you know i this was at a point where they had had an issue with people um carrying their paperwork around um so they actually when you got there they wouldn't give it to you you couldn't request it i luckily had some of mine already saved and i had them printed out and then mailed to me Mm -hmm. uh that ended up becoming a problem, and I finally ended up having to win on that one because I'm like, look, these guys are trying to say that I'm a sex offender. You right. know, I, I mean, my story's wild, you know, as it is, and I, I'm, I'm like, you know, nobody believes me. You know, I'm getting, you know, physically assaulted, you know, and it's, you know, like stuff's escalating. They didn't want to hear any of that. They don't care, you know, and I had a... I had, uh, our counselor was being, uh, investigated for, uh, a sexual, um, what, what is it called when, when you, you are inappropriate with a coworker? Yeah. Oh, okay. Indiscretions or. Yes. Yeah. yeah it, he was, uh, yeah. So, so they're, you know, married guy. He's obviously cheating on his wife. They, they know about it. They keep, they keep this guy as a counselor. He knows his his job's on the line, you know, so he's not doing anything. He wasn't willing to help anybody. You you know, there was no home plan for me. And I was still on probation, unsupervised probation in Virginia. So what did Virginia do? Immediately put a detainer on me. So that killed me for any of the programs I was only supposed to do. I was only supposed to do six months and then go to a halfway house and finish my time out in a halfway house. They right. said they put that detainer on me as soon as I got to BOP and that killed me. And so right. I did. And, and so they said to me, they're like, well, um, I, I I made a scene in the counselor's office when he told me he was like, well, you, you know, you can't go to a halfway house. You can't get that. And I'm like, you know, for what reason? You know, um, why is this warrant there? Can you help me get the warrant off? Virginia responded and was like, yep, well, nope, you're going to have to come here and go to court. We're going to have to transport you. And so that's what they did. They took me to some raggedy ass, you know, little county jail in in, uh, northern Pennsylvania. Left me there for two weeks. Came and got me, brought me back down here. And so I've been home now. I did on the entire charge. I did almost two years. So it had been like 19 months. And so I've been home now since uh, the middle of last year. What do you do now for a living? Um, and, and here's the thing. So it's been super hard to get a job. Um, you know, I've been, uh, I started a detailing company, so I was detailing airplanes again. Um, and, but because of the distinctions the court put on me, they told me I'm not allowed to be around an airport or live around an airport or be within a mile of, of an airport for the time that I was on supervised probation. Right. So my probation was only a year. I did my entire probation. I was, you know, bouncing through odd jobs and stuff, working on cars and, and you know, that uh, when I finally got off of probation, which I'm, you know, fully off of everything, you know, now state and federal, you know, no, but no conditions, um, you know, uh, I started working on airplanes again and I was I, I moved to Florida uh, back down, you know, down where my mom was, uh, you know, that didn't last because every time somebody would run a background check on me, they'd see this and then they'd say, oh, well, you, you know, we can't put you on our insurance or, you know, um, you know, we don't hire felons. And, you know, I walk into every interview and tell them, hey, look, this is what I got on my record. Can you work with it? Right. And so l- luckily I found uh, a repair shop down in san marcos texas that you know i could move to i'm a full-time rv guy so you know i live 
you know, I can pretty much pack up and go whenever I want. Um, it's an all right deal. Uh, it's not really, I, you know, I don't know if, if, if airplanes and working on them and all this stuff is really worth it. Cause I don't know if I can get, you know, nobody can give me a, a correct, uh, distinct, nobody can say whether or not I can have a certificate. It's right. all gray area, you know, so I might be doing all this work, you know, and, and logging all these hours, you know, in the hopes of trying to get a certificate, go to get a certificate and then say, absolutely not. Um, so when someone requests or pulls my, if someone does a, pulls my, uh, my criminal record, my background mm -hmm. check on my federal case, mm -hmm. um, I don't, it, my, my stuff doesn't come up. Really? Yeah. So I'm wondering, and, and by the way, nobody I know does it come up. Oh, mine does. I've so, seen it. Okay. I was going to say, so I'm wondering. I, sh I, I should actually, the background check I sent you should have it. Oh, okay. It should I'm, be, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm wondering. Yeah, I, I have now, up. I have seen, I have seen when, um, like if they just use like a regular Sterling company, like if, if Sterling, if somebody runs my background for, if like Sterling does it or, you know, one of those background check companies, they do it. Now that won't show up there if it's just right. a regular background check, but when it's, but for TSA and DOT, it always shows up. Yeah. I was going to say, so, um, like if you go to get an apartment complex or you go to get a regular job. Oh yeah. Gonna... No, I, I try to get an apartment. Can't get an apartment. Really? Cause see, I, I've, yeah, I've no, done that uh -huh. twice. Both times it came back. Like, both times they said nothing came back. Like one guy, I went and I said, this is what I've got. And the guy said, it, and I told him, I said, but it's, I said, it's federal. And I've heard they don't show up. What should I do? He goes, don't put it down. He goes, uh, let me a... run it first. So he ran it. He said, didn't even come up. He said, don't worry about it. Yeah. And then the next time, same thing, never came up. So I, I've had it happen several times and it's never come up. And I have a couple of buddies that have said the same thing, mm -hmm. but I've also had buddies who went to go get a job at a um, at a factory that made something for the federal government? Mm -hmm. So he had to have a security, and he said, "He said, no, I got nothing. I'm good." They came back. And they said, "Nah, <laughs> so you oh, yeah. a, you're it's, in the federal. You're in federal prison for." I mean, I get said no to you, you know. I so I had a uh, I go to the interview for a job uh, two weeks ago. You know, and everybody, you know, everybody's all excited. The money was super good. They were willing, they were giving me $30 an hour. You know, I'd be working, putting in, you know, avionics and airplanes, which is something I'm, I'm super good at. And uh, it, so the lady calls me back and so she's like, okay, she's like, well, you know, I got to run your background check. You know, we, you, you, you said you had a felony and, and, you know, it shouldn't be a problem and blah, 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 blah. So then she calls me back like about four hours later and she said, are you really a domestic terrorist? Oh my God. And I was like, are you kidding me? She was like, yeah, she was we like, can. so they have a federal fire. This place had a federal firearms permit. And so the type of background check, I guess is, you know, that they have the ability to run, you know, so right. she looked back and so she was like, yeah, she was like, you know, it, uh, it, your live scans all, she, she was like, you know, uh, and I had already made the move to Texas at that point, you know, I had already, you know, they had given me the, the sign on it bonus and everything, the money to move. I was like, all right, you know, I hooked up, came down here, go to start the job, go the first day. And then they're like, yeah, don't even go and do the drug test. They're like, you know, we have a federal firearms permit. We didn't know that it was all this. And I was like, well, you know, I told you, <laughs> you know, right. I wasn't like I lied. So yeah, it's been super, it's been super hard to get a job and I'm kind of getting to the point where, you know, I don't, there's gotta be something else, you know, there's gotta be something better than, than, you know, going through. And I mean, it's a lot of stress. It's a lot of work, you know, that's, you know, small airplanes too, you know, I love flying them, but I'm to the point where it's like, you know, I would love to do it as a hobby and not it be the main way i make money and the problem right. is is that my entire employment history is that so right. you know it's well, been super I mean, hurting. yeah <sighs> dude it's a, dude it's a story i mean it, it, it is um it's not good it's not 
what are you going to, so what are you going to, what are you thinking? You said you're detailing. You got to, well, no, I mean, I, you, you know, I'm working for this repair shop now. Uh, you, you know what I mean? That's, I've started that and, you know, it seems to be, you know, everything seems to be fine. They, they ran the background. They, they, you know, he told me he's got, you know, guys working for him that have, you know, one, I mean, one guy's got, you know, a real violent record. Right. Uh, you know, the other guys, you know, he's got a bunch of drug addicts and stuff down there. But he's got it. But the, the guys in his maintenance shop, I mean, all those dudes, they really know what they're doing. Right. All of those are straight. Are, they're straight A guys. You know, some of the porters and things that, you know, been doing the parts, you know, some of them are the. And my, the, I was going to say my ex-wife would, uh, when she pulls rent for her, her renters, when she pulls a mm -hmm. criminal background check for the renters, there, you know, guy, she's like, you have a felony. And the guy's like. She had one guy, the guy said, um, I do. And be honest, you know, I did like 12 years in prison and he was like, it was for murder. And she goes, did you murder your landlord? And he <laughs> was like, no, she's like, okay, well, I'm good with murder. She <laughs> said, <laughs> she said that's fine. She said, I'm concerned about, you know, she was concerned about like drugs, you know, sex offenders, you know, things, yeah, certain yeah. things, like, yeah, certain yeah, yeah. things that I, you know, she's like, you know, rape. She's like that. Those are, she said, but. You, she said, you got into a fight or shot somebody or whatever it was. She's like, you did 12 yeah. years fine. So it's funny that, that she was like, I'm ready. She said, unless it was your landlord. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But um, yeah. Yeah. You got to figure. So, you fit, so well, I mean, you're, you, like you said, you know, what about just being a mechanic? Well, you know, being a, a car mechanic, right? Like that's. I mean, the problem. So, you know, I run into to this a, a lot is that. You know, places where you have to work on things, they have insurance policies. And as soon as they they look at my record, you know, every insurance company, you know, I, and I found this out the hard way. So my mom's an insurance agent and we tried to get me business insurance. Like we tried to start my own company. Right. And I just tried to get like a basic business insurance policy. And the insurance company said, we don't even know how, you know, like, you know, first of all, you, you got a criminal record, so we can't you know, insuring you is damn near impossible. Right. And their underwriter was, you know, kind of explaining to me, yeah, that, you know, that's, it's normally the reason why when, when people say, oh, well, we had to run a background check. It's not because, you know, the company really cares. Right. It's, it's, because, the the company. it's because the insurance company and because they'll raise the premium up, you know, now they got to pay the premium for you and then a salary for you or, you know, whatever, you know, your wages, they got to now pay you a wage. And, you know, I, in a perfect world, you know, I would be, you know, doing this, you know, podcasting, you know, right. I would just, I'd just be talking and, you know, interviewing interesting people. Um, I've tried to start a podcast. Um, it's not really taken off. Um, you, you know, it's, the, the, it's, it's hard, um, you, you know, um, but I, I definitely want to do something different, uh, you know, I'm, I'm to the point where it's the, the money that I'm, 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 I'm making and the money that I'm going to have to, you know, continue to make to be able to sustain a license and to be able to sustain a, a, uh, um, a mechanic certificate. And then, you know, if the shop's going to require me to have my own insurance, then that's the other thing too. So some shops require the mechanics to go and get their own policies. Um, you know, especially if you're a contract guy. Right. So, you know, this industry is not, I mean, I mean, and, and it's a fading industry too, you know, I mean, aviation is, I mean, there's with more automation, you know, more streamlined processes, you know, and less people, you know, flying small airplanes, which is kind of a damn shame. Um, you know, people don't want to pay, you know, constantly. I've been at four shops uh, in the last year. And, you know, it always boils down to people don't want to pay their bills, which ends up meaning that the companies can't pay their guys. And so, you know, um, I would love to say that the industry is getting better. You, you know, I mean, things are getting cooler. Yeah, obviously, the technologies are getting cooler. But I can tell you what, safety is not getting cooler. Last year was by far the deadliest year on record. You know, I buried four friends last year um, from aviation incidences that all could have been could have been you know stopped right you know two one of them was a doom flight to begin with and somebody should have intervened and had to and had to wherewithal to say hey you guys need to not go you know 
a family would still kind of would, would be here. So yeah, it's it's and that's the other thing too in this industry. You it's <laughs> you know I hate to equate it back to drugs, but I mean it's almost as deadly as having friends that are drug addicts. Right, you know, they're drug just as aviation. You know. Well, um, but do you do thank like, you for, thank you, like, you for. Okay, I was going to say, you feel like we covered everything? Yeah, I definitely feel like we covered everything. I was going to say, dude, uh, this has been awesome, man. Thank you for giving me a chance to, to, to tell the story. Yeah. You know, um, and, uh, you know, thank you for taking an interest. Um, you're the first one that's actually allowed me to talk and allow me to. Um, yeah, I'm curious you know, to know what uh, what Colby does with the intro. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I definitely. Know. He'll, definitely. He'll, 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 cherry pick some some moments and come up with so them. if if where where do i where do i find this it's on all major uh platforms right yeah it'll be on uh i mean it'll be on well spotify including the the video will be on spotify okay cool because yeah. now you can upload video to spotify too oh really so okay. upload, like the audio the video and then it'll be on youtube but okay. I, and that'll be that'll probably you know spotify obviously trickles down to other things you know apple yeah sure um, yeah 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 but uh, but yeah, mostly it's, it's YouTube that I focus on, you know, that's what Perfect. It, the, the videos are kind of geared toward. Um, all right. And well, so is, is yeah. this your main source of income now? Yeah, this is, this is all pretty much all I do. I got, so listen, I got another one here at four o'clock. I got two tomorrow. I got a guy, I got a lawyer that's, that's driving up from Miami area, um, who has, he's just hilarious. Like he's a hilarious, he's fun. He's a defense, you know, criminal defense attorney. He's, uh, he's, he's just got one story after another. So he's going to come, sure. he's coming in person. Cool. The rest of them are stream yards. I typically do three stream yards a week and one in person, but I have to schedule like seven. Right. Right. And, you know, cause people just, they just, they don't show or they, at the last minute, Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, this happened or that happened. It's like, okay, that's cool. Right. And you so, try and reschedule. so do you, uh, you offer a subscription service like no. Patreon? Or I, mean, I do Patreon. I do Patreon. Okay. We, we do ask for Patreon. Um, okay. but you know, people either, they either sign up, they pay the 10 bucks or they don't. And, you know, sure. Yeah. That's yeah, fine. Yeah. I mean, it helps because by the end, at the end of the month, it, it's several hundred dollars. Like it's, you know, three, 400 bucks that, yeah, that, know, that, that great yeah, because that's, yeah, that's a nice chunk of money, right? Yeah, for sure. And I would love to, I'd love to pick your brain kind of off air on how, uh, on how you monetize this. Um, cause you know, I mean, this would definitely be something that, you know, I'm interested in and I'm in a really good place for it too. You know, San Marcos isn't far away from Austin, you know, right. you know, I'm right down the road. So, um, you know, I, I would like to, I'd like to pursue, you know, podcasting and maybe stand up or something like that. You know, I have, I have tons of stories, tons of, you know, right. And you, you know, a way to, to make it funny. So, well, I think the, um, um, I think interviewing people through StreamYard is like, it's an easy way to, to get content. Sure. And so how do you, um, is, is this a paid for, uh, the service? Your, yeah. Your StreamYard. Yeah, it, I think you pay two two. Uh, it's like two fifty or three hundred fifty dollars um, a year. Oh, that's not bad. That's yeah, not bad. Yeah, but it's, okay. it's. I mean, you could do it monthly, or you can just pay it outright. Uh, sure. I don't think it's that sure. much. I think it's a couple hundred, two three hundred bucks, something like that. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, I mean, this is great. And I, yeah, I see that I, I see that it has the live streaming capability too. Right. I need to start live streaming. I talked to a guy the other day that was telling me all he does is live streams and he's making an ungodly amount of money. I don't even know how it's possible that he's making as much money as he is. Because the advertisers, so I have heard of that. That's a new, that's a newer thing. So what the advertisers are doing is the advertisers are hammering the, uh, they'll, they'll hammer the, the, you know, free ads around. Right. And they're just able to, and it's just money, 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 money. Because, you know, if you stream, depending on how, you know, many viewers he's got, you know, if somebody clicks there, there, I think those ones, you don't even, you get the money regardless if they click. So, um, but yeah, I would definitely like to, to pick your brain off air and try to figure out how to monetize my show. I made a Patreon. Um, that's where I put, uh, that emergency episode up um the one that i sent you i don't know if you watched uh the youtube video that i sent you right um i don't know which one which one i watched um 
They'd say only there there had only been one. Yeah, there was only only one video. Well, I watched one with you. Yeah, yeah, that was me. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's the only one. Yeah, that's the only one. It's called emergency. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so I had had a guy. Well, you know, uh, I mean that they shut the Patreon down. Why? Uh, Somebody called and said that that um, uh, somebody called. uh, I guess that somebody called the FAA, the FAA and made a complaint and said that I was making a show where I was giving flying advice and that I wasn't qualified to do it. Oh and so, God. and then they, the FAA called, made the complaint to Patreon and said that I was spreading misinformation so that I wasn't qualified to talk about what I was talking about. Well, the, here's the thing. Patreon shuts the page down, but there was no content on the page. I hadn't even put uploaded anything. So I was like, you guys tried to stop this before I got started. Like, and I, I mean, am I, <laughs> It, it it was wild. And what it was was a, the guy that was, was disgruntled that I worked for that was disgruntled that you know, he called and made the complaint. And he used to work for the FAA. So, you know, and I guess he had them call Patreon and it, it was down for like two days. I was in the process of uploading, you know, uh, an episode I did with a buddy of mine. Um, and uh I went to go up. I went to go log in, and then it said something about verifying the account. So then I verified the account, and then uh, Patreon said. And then it came back with an, an error message that said that uh, my ability to upload has been temporarily suspended. Please call. And so I mean that lasted for like four days, and I just got real mad. And so I made that up. Epi- I made that episode, and then I was like, all right, well I'm going to at least cover you know all the stuff I wanted to. And that, that of course was very rough. I mean. I, but, and I did it in haste, obviously. So, but yeah, I mean, I really like this stream lab. I, this, this is a, a pretty cool way to do it. Hey, if you guys like the episode, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell. So you get notified of videos just like this. Also, please consider joining my Patreon. Uh, all of my book links are in the description and we are going to put uh, Ryan's YouTube page in the, um, Uh, in the description also. So if you want to check out his YouTube, really appreciate you guys. See ya.